Hey, everybody, this is Ben Bowman and Reagan Canope. Welcome back to another episode of The Oregon Bridge. Still feels super early. None of these fundraising numbers that we've just discussed for any of the candidates, I think, is an amount where someone would think twice about running against them if they were wanting to run for that seat. Negative infinity. If the negative infinity is an option, I'm going with that one. I think that Republicans would need three or four large red waves in order to win this seat. It's like D plus 22. This is going to be decided in the primary. It looks like it could be a pretty fun primary. This race is, no matter what happens, going to cost several millions of dollars on both sides. Yep. Now that the legislative session is over, it's time for Oregon's activists, candidates, and political committees to turn their attention to the 2024 elections. With government regulation of political activities becoming more complicated nearly every year, and with political actors increasingly initiating complaints and litigation to achieve political goals, having experienced legal counsel has become critical to success in the political arena. Harang Long PC has represented clients involved in candidate and ballot measure elections for decades. To learn more about Harang Long's political law practice, check out our website at harang.com. That's www.harrang.com. All right, folks, uh, this week, Reagan and I were thinking about what we wanted to discuss, and we decided that it would be a great time for an update on congressional races, statewide races, and a couple of shakeups in the state legislature that seem noteworthy at this early stage. So it is November 5th. We are uh, almost exactly one year out from Election Day. There's a long runway until... Uh, what we're going to talk about actually matters, but it is fun fodder for uh, political nerds like us. And it also, um, we're going to talk about fundraising numbers uh, that, uh, you know, there's a there's a saying in politics, uh, Emily's List actually is named after this saying, early money is like yeast, it helps the dough rise. So early money, which we're going to talk about today, all the money received today would be considered early money, is oftentimes a useful indicator of who's a serious candidate and who is not. Uh, Reagan, any wisdom on early political fundraising before we dive into the first set of races here? Well, two things, Ben. As I, as we recorded this on Sunday night, I opened the 270 to win countdown clock. We are 365 days, two hours, and 15 minutes until the election. So the countdown really begins. It's, it's one year until the election, and everybody's looking at one year out polls and freaking out and they shouldn't be because <laughs> those polls are useless tomorrow. Um, the other thing about the early money is that um, it's not as much or how much money you raise early that helps, but it also matters who donates. So you'll look at someone's fundraising and if you see some big names with small dollars, that probably means those big names are coming in with more dollars later. Um, cause they don't want to, you know, once they invest in a race, they typically don't, uh, aren't interested in losing. And so they'll invest more later on. So a lot of candidates will work, um, their list to try to get their foot in the door with some of the key donors in their regions, um, or, uh, for that particular type of race. And then, um, you know, engage those donors as the race develops to try to keep them interested. So it's a good, it's good strategy for candidates, free advice. All right. Uh, free advice from Reagan Canope and worth every penny that you just paid for it. Um, OK, so we're going to jump into uh, the first set of races, and that is the congressional races. Um, yes. There's a big filing deadline last quarter. But actually, Reagan, before we jump into the numbers, I want to start with uh, the race for Congressional District 3. Um, mm -hmm. Congressman Earl Blumenauer. Uh, long time member of Congress. Is he the dean of Oregon's uh, federal delegation or did Wyden beat him there? Uh, no, I'm pretty he, sure Wyden. Well, actually, I'll, I'll, I'll go check. Reagan will fact check in real time. Uh, either way, Earl Blumenauer retiring is a bit of an earthquake in uh, Democratic circles in Oregon politics because he represents a very deep blue part of Portland um, and the Portland metro area. It actually goes um, out east. Uh, but it's a deep blue seat, and that means that a lot of Democrats want to run for it. So uh, while Reagan uh, is looking... 
then we're we're not very smart because Earl Blumenauer uh, took the seat that Ron Wyden held when Wyden went to the Senate. So Wyden's obviously been there longer. Wyden got there in 1981 and then 96 is when Blumenauer got there. So but he is the he is now the elder uh, statesman in the House for uh, Democrats and Republicans, because um, there's a story in Capitol Chronicle about how a Walden turned over last uh, or two cycles ago, I think it was, and then DeFazio last cycle, mm-hmm. and now Blumenauer, and so that's going to leave uh, Suzanne Bonamici. Um, you know, she's got a pretty tough race coming up. Not really, that's a joke. <laughs> um, but anyway, she's going to be the longest serving, and she got there, I think, in the um, mid to late two thousands. It is a pretty wild um, turn of events to have so much seniority turnover all at the same time um, for Oregon. Mm-hmm. So, okay, so we'll go through. So, so Blumenauer, first I'll make a plug. You should read the Willamette Week piece where they interview Blumenauer um, about his decision to retire. A couple of very interesting yeah. things in there. One, he says he's not going to endorse um, anyone to fill his seat. So that's um, big news. It means it'll be a truly open field. Um, and here's what we know so far. Uh, Multnomah County Commissioner Sushila Jayapal is running. Uh, and she's very serious, uh, very serious candidate, in part because she's a regional elected official, in part because her sister, Pramila Jayapal, is a member of Congress from Washington and, importantly, chair of the Congressional Progressive Caucus um, mm-hmm. in OPB. This is the quote they use about why that matters. Political observers believe those ties will give the county commissioner a leg up in raising funds and making connections, um, which seems true to me. I think it is an advantage for her. Um, in a very serious way. She also had to quit her seat on the Multnomah County Commission in order to run for this. So high Mm -hmm. level of commitment there. The reason she had to do that is because of the Multnomah County Charter, which says you can't seek another office while you are in office. And I would be super interested if that's like a legal limitation that you can really put on people or if people just follow it because no one has challenged it. It was a super one of those quirky Oregon laws like the kicker and until recently not being able to pump your own gas i guess but that was um that was fascinating to me uh so a couple of other candidates are in the mix here um another candidate has declared and that is gresham city councilor eddie morales um yep. he's in his second term on the gresham city councilor and he's the treasurer of the democratic party of oregon he also ran for mayor of gresham and narrowly lost in uh, the 13 last votes ben 13 was it 13 votes. very close mm-hmm. election very close so um, there's a couple of people who are publicly considering one. Yep. They are their colleagues in the Oregon uh, State House. One is Representative Maxine Dexter uh, and one is Representative Travis Nelson. They represent different parts of Portland. Travis in North Portland, Maxine um, in West Portland. Yep. Uh, and then there are a whole host of people who are not running uh, first the person who I think a lot of people thought might run is um, former county chair Deborah Kafori. She says she is not running. Um, and then Willamette Week reported that three other people are officially pulling themselves out of the running. One is state treasurer Tobias Reed, who we'll talk about in just a moment. One is former Portland City Commissioner Steve Novick and former Governor Kate Brown uh, not running for Congress in the first, or, excuse me, the third CD. Uh, that's the third CD. Reagan, what do you give, uh, what chance do you give the Republicans of taking back the third congressional district next cycle? Uh, what, what's the largest available negative number, Ben? <laughs> what, uh, negative infinity? If negative infinity is an option, I'm going with that one. Uh, I think that would be the it would smallest take about, available negative it, number, it would, not the largest. Oh, interesting. <laughs> I'm not very good at math, Ben. That's why I chose politics. Uh, luckily, no math involved in politics. Uh, but um, I think that uh, Republicans would need three or four large red waves in order to win this seat. It's like D plus uh, 22. Um, so no, I would say the Democrats, uh, this is going to be decided in the primary. Um, it looks like it could be a, a, a pretty fun primary, um, but we'll see kind of how it develops. I mean, I think, I think uh, Jaya Paul probably has the like, early edge and if there's a lot of candidates i think that benefits her splitting the vote if she only gets maybe one or two challengers then it could be could be harder so i think we'll see how that and goes. again we'll note we're, 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 we are recording this on sunday november 5th i think even by the time that this gets uploaded on wednesday it is likely that there will be uh another candidate in the race um or at least possible i think i think but 
Maxine has said very soon is when she'll decide. And I think Travis has said by the end of the week. So uh, things are changing quickly. I also know that there's several other people who are rumored to be considering it, whose names we will not uh, say out loud here on the podcast, but I would not be surprised if this is very crowded primary. I don't believe Ben knows anything special. I think he's just trying to make you guys think he's important. <laughs> you're, you're tempting me, but it's not going to work, Reagan. Uh, <laughs> we are going to talk next about money. Uh, let's talk first about what I think a lot of folks think will be one of the most competitive races in the United States of America. And that is the race for Congressional District 5, where uh, Congresswoman Lori Chavez Dreamer is the incumbent and raising impressive amounts of money. Um, as of the last quarterly report, uh, this was on October 15th, a couple weeks ago, she had $1.3 million essentially in cash on hand. Mm -hmm. She had a debt of about 379000 And in the quarter, she raised 620000 I'm starting with her because of every member of Congress in this state. She is at the top. And in some, in, by, for most of them, it's over double. I think the only one who it's not over double in terms of them out raised in the quarter is uh, Congresswoman Andrea Salinas. Um, but really impressive numbers there. Uh, from the incumbent congresswoman um she has uh two no three notable opponents in that race uh yep. jamie mcleod skinner representative janelle bynum and uh metro president lynn peterson lynn peterson raised about seventy two thousand dollars in the quarter with forty three forty four thousand dollars on hand representative bynum raised one hundred and eighty eight thousand dollars in the quarter with two hundred and eighteen thousand on hand and then Jamie McLeod Skinner uh, is number one on the Democratic side in terms of money. She raised about two hundred fifty-four thousand and has about one hundred fifty-five thousand on hand. Uh, Reagan, what do you make of the numbers? Well, Ben, uh, if I were the Democrats here, I'm sounding alarm bells for a couple of reasons. One, uh, nobody has raised as much as Travis Dreamer has in a single quarter. Nobody's cash on hand comes close, and all three of those candidates have to empty or probably get close to emptying their coffers in the primary in order to give themselves the best shot at victory. And then they have to play catch up again with Java's dreamer, who doesn't appear to be drawing a significant Republican opponent. So certainly the Democrats can come in with outside money. Uh, they can come in with leadership pack money, right? But um, the candidates themselves get the best rates on TV. And raising hard dollars is typically seen as a sign of strength. And that's like direct campaign cash. And then the other packs are a little bit more, you know, sometimes they're considered uh, soft money or kind of outside money, but th that money doesn't go as far. And so Dems will have to spend more to get caught up. And so I think that, um, you know, it's already going to be, it's already going to be tough. And certainly, you know, the registration and other parts of, you know, other advantages that they have. We'll keep them in this this race, but um, it's an early and strong lead for Chavez Dreamer that they really don't want to have to overcome after a messy primary. I think that's right, and I also think I mean, what would, hard to it's very hard to tell um, this early out, but you could eat th this race is no matter what happens going to cost several millions of dollars on both sides. Yep. So most of the money that will be spent in this race has not been raised yet by either side. Um, For sure. And to your point, I think some of the, the numbers from last cycle, it's really hard to keep straight, like DNC numbers, Biden numbers, Trump numbers, RNC numbers, DSCC numbers, um, DCCC numbers, um, like, but I'm pretty sure that Democrats are out raising this cycle. But now I'm wondering if I'm conflating DTRIP with, um, no, you're saying yes, that's true. No, I think you're correct. NRCC was lagging DCCC in the last quarter. And I think the U.S. Senate R's and D's are like roughly close. I think the R's might be out raising a little bit because they have a pretty strong slate. Um, I just saw a Jeff Merkley fundraising email the other day, and he was like, in order to hold 50 seats in the Senate, we have to win all seven swing races. And I was like, whoa, that is a rough map. Um, so I haven't doubled... I I haven't double checked that, but that is uh, that that's a very Republican friendly map. If you have to win every swing race in order to hold your Senate majority, that's tough. Did that motivate you to give money to Senator Markley's campaign? Yeah, I smashed I smashed the <laughs> donate button. My act blue obviously automatically populated as I'm a, a, a strong Democratic donor. Uh, uh, and he got my 50 cents that time. Yes, absolutely. Uh, OK, so the reason I bring that up is just because as we saw in Oregon last time, um, 
a lot of the resources that get spent in these races are controlled nationally and they're going to yep. look at a board basically of races and they're going to look at polling they're going to look at demographic data they're going to look at all sorts of inputs and then make a calculation about where to spend money um mm -hmm. so uh there's definitely a gap between incumbent and challenger in this race it's republican advantage democratic yeah. disadvantage in the next district we're going to talk about it's slightly flipped um but we should all well, keep this in seat mind. this seat was biden plus eight too so that's why dems want it is it is it performed really well in the presidential um this seat didn't exist in 2020 but when you overlay the the precinct data it's a biden plus eight seat so so democrats are right to go after it obviously for sure um yeah so, so i was just gonna say like it's early. The numbers here are indicative of trends, but certainly not insurmountable. And we should all expect these numbers to change. And of course, the gap to shrink um, once a Democratic nominee is established here and a Republican nominee is established in CD6. With that, let's transition to CD6, where incongr incumbent Congresswoman Andrea Salinas is uh, far ahead. Um, not to the same degree. She doesn't have the same net numbers, but the gap between her and her challenger um, is uh, essentially equivalent. So she raised $424,000 and she has uh, $758,000 on hand. Um, the only declared candidate at this point is former state Senator Denise Bowles. Uh, she raised just $60,000 and has 45,000 on hand. Although Reagan, I believe she got in midway through the quarter, correct? She, that's not a full quarter. She did. Yeah. That there's no, that's not a full quarter um, fundraising. Um, and, and there's rumors. That, there, there's also rumors. I think this has been reported publicly that um, Mike Erickson, who was the, the GOP nominee last cycle is actively considering jumping in the race again and if i remember right he self-funded a significant amount of money so i i um, believe he will get in um so i'm pulling up the 2022 numbers for that district um so erickson uh spent well so he took in the most amount of money but a lot of that was self-contributions but he spent almost four million dollars um and salinas uh took in and spent three and a half million and then there was some outside money um, I think just on her side, though, I don't think the National Republicans came in for Erickson. But yeah, I'm told he will get into the race. He's just waiting because um, he doesn't need to get in early. And um, when you're spending your own money, maybe you wait a little longer if you've just spent a bunch. If you've just got $4 million worth of name ID on TV, you have a head start when you get into this race. Um, so I think he's just waiting to make sure he can minimize how much he needs to spend in the primary. And that's probably the right strategy um for him gonna be tough to overcome all that self-financing and name id um the way i the this board is presented ours have put all three of four five and six on the nrcc target list and i believe dems have put all three of those um on their target or frontline protection list for the incumbents um ours believe the fifth is the most obviously likely to succeed because they have an incumbent there they're actually looking at the fourth next. They think the numbers are better than the sixth district. The fourth district has more rural areas and they think is trending more Republican long term. Is, this... is that something they're saying? Uh, that's something I believe based on sources I'm talking to. I don't know if it's something they're saying publicly, but but the people I talk to, they think four. the national folks think four is a little bit more gettable. Um, but we'll we'll see. But about on, that. Pa on paper, the fourth is a bigger margin than the sixth, right? Uh, well, it depends on what you're looking at. I don't, I don't have registration in front of me in the last election. Hoyle won by seven points and Salinas by one or one and a half. So if you're looking at the margins that way, you'd, you'd look at the six first, but six is a little bit more suburban district and tends to be trending away from ours. Whereas fourth has more rural, um, that they think is trending a little bit more their direction. So, well, we'll have so to wait and see whose theories are correct to there. I was going to say, a good transition to quickly wrap up our congressional numbers here. Uh, Congresswoman Val Hoyle raised 254000 with 374000 on hand, and notably not a single opponent filed against her. And in fact, her opponent last time, Alex Garlados, will not be running against her this time. Why is that, Reagan? Uh, because he decided there was a fourth district he liked better in the Oregon House <laughs> of Representatives. And uh, that is a, a open Republican seat. Uh, which we'll talk about later, but he's got a pretty good shot there. Um, much more favorable, heavy R leaning seat. I believe the R registration is like two to one. Um, mm -hmm. so I think he'd have the advantage on that seat. We'll see if he gets any opponents. 
So real quick before we transition to statewide office, I do think it's worth mentioning here. Um, and this, I think, probably benefits Salinas and the not and Hoyle and um, the nominee for uh, CD5 for the Democrats. Uh, Suzanne Bonamici has 584000 on hand and Earl Blumenauer has 775000 on the in the bank. They are mm. unlikely to spend all of that. They'll probably keep a lot of it, but I imagine that some of those dollars will be spent on Democrats in competitive seats in Oregon. I don't know that. I'm just guessing. Um, meanwhile, on the other side, Cliff Bentz has an impressive 910000 911000 in the bank for the Republicans. So there's a lot of money out there in the world um, in safe seat accounts, and who knows what, how that will be spent. I think Benson Bonamici will want to give more to their leadership packs to kind of, you know, build their rapport with all of their colleagues. Um, sure. Whereas Blumenauer may be more interested in direct giving because he doesn't have anything to gain by um, giving it to the DC Democrats. So I think that yeah, that, sounds right. that would be my guess on kind of how those funds kind of broadly get distributed. Okay, real quickly, uh, before we wrap this episode, we're going to talk about where things stand uh, for statewide office. So we'll start with the second in line to the governorship, the Secretary of State's office. Uh, obviously, we have uh, an incumbent Secretary of State who will not be running for re-election. It is an open seat. Uh, two major Democratic candidates, uh, current State Treasurer Tobias Reed and uh, State Senator James Manning. It's very early in these races. These races will also cost substantially less than the congressional races will, uh, or at least that's the way it looks at this point. That can all change with um, competitive candidates. But right now, uh, Treasurer Reed has $66,000 in the bank, and Senator James Manning has $33,000 in the bank. Uh, Reagan, there's no Republicans filed, correct? Yeah, that's correct. I was just double checking that on the or star candidate filing. So hard to win a race when you don't have any candidates um, <laughs> right now. Democrats, 100 percent favorites to win those seats, uh, that's true. you know, as a, as opposed to usual, 120, 115 percent. But um, no, I think that uh, Reed is the front runner. Um, uh, I'm looking at my candidate tracker and um, seeing a couple of rumored Republicans, but I haven't got a sense that they're they're serious at this point. Um, you know, Manning is, uh, I'm not seeing a lot of strong fundraising yet, so he would really need to, uh, flip on the afterburners to make this a, a competitive fight. Um, but he might get some name ID out of it for a future run for office or something like that. So, um, he's there are also, reasons people run statewide that don't include trying to win sometimes. He's also midterm, so he will stay in the Senate if he does lose. Um, yep. Uh, okay, next office, state treasurer, incumbent Tobias Reed, term limited, cannot run for another term at Treasury. Um, two major Democratic candidates have filed. The first is Senator Elizabeth Steiner. She is the current co-chair of the Powerful Ways and Means Committee in the legislature. Uh, she has raised 60, or excuse me, she has $60,000 in the bank. Um, and then uh, Jeff Goodman, former Lake Oswego city councilor, uh, and former two-time GOP nominee for state treasurer, uh, he is now running as a Democrat. He has raised uh, about ten thousand dollars so far in that race. Um, yeah. Ben, I've got a question for you on this one. Are you hearing anything in in your kind of circles that leads you to believe there'll be any more strong candidates that declare for these two offices? Because at, at this point, I haven't heard anything, and it makes me kind of think these primaries are are pretty well, you know, set as they are. I have not heard anything, but it still feels super early. Um, it does. Like, you know, none of these fundraising numbers that we've just discussed for any of the candidates, I think, is an amount where someone would think twice about running against them if they were wanting to run for that seat. Um, so I think it's too early to say. I think if you yeah. if there's anyone you challenge, it's probably Steiner for treasure. She doesn't have statewide name ID. Reed has more statewide name ID. Um, although not an insurmountable uh, amount if you really had some serious deep pockets. But um, I think Treasure is the one where you could see more people. But I think a lot of people um, aren't interested in taking on either of these just because they know they're tough customers either way. Steiner and Reed are both well known in political circles. And so that makes them um, difficult to beat in a primary. Well, so the the other thing that I'll mention on this is it is early and there's a significant advantage and advantage to starting early 
Um, and it's not just raising money because in some cases, starting early, you have more time to raise money, but you got more time to spend money. So it doesn't always work out the way that people think it will. But all of these candidates will have a, literally a, over a year to solicit endorsements and build a team of supporters. And those yep. things matter, particularly in voters pamphlet statements um, for primary elections. But like you've seen on Treasure Reads um, campaign account, he's been endorsed by Governor Barbara Roberts. He's been endorsed by um, former state treasurer Jim Hill. Um Senator Steiner on her website lists endorsements from Congresswoman Hoyle, former state treasurer Randall Edwards, the Senate president, the Senate majority leader, um, the speaker, uh, you know, like those, those are endorsements that are locked up now, right? That, that like that are taken off the table. So they start to build on top of each other. They start to look appealing to institutional groups who might be supporting candidates. So yeah, like it's it, the money is not huge, but the endorsements that start stacking on top of each other do feel impactful. So, yeah, yeah. that's what I know about that. Uh, so the next race is different than the previous two races. Um, yeah. And that is the race for attorney general, uh, where the numbers are actually, I think, enough to make someone not want to run. Uh, Dan Rayfield, current speaker of the House, has two hundred and seventy thousand dollars in his pack. That's a lot of money. Um, and Will Lathrop, the Republican candidate, um, who obviously both these folks still have to win their primaries, but he's already got $146,000 in the bank, which is mm -hmm. frankly a very large amount of money for a Republican statewide um, challenger in this political environment in this state. Um, so both of those folks, I think, are unlikely to see a primary challenger in their uh, in their respective races. Yep. The only one who could really challenge Lathrop are uh, the two representatives with law degrees, Representative Wallen and Representative Mannix, and I believe both of them are running for re-election, so um, they will not get into those races, or that's to even, that race. That's not even mentioning the previous GOP nominee for Attorney General, who was not an attorney. Uh, <laughs> okay. he, was, uh, he was weird. Most of us didn't like him, just to be clear. <laughs> Okay, uh, last category before we wrap up the pod on this late Sunday night. Uh, there are a couple, there were a couple of noteworthy endorse or excuse me, announcements for state Senate uh, over the last couple of weeks. Reagan, why don't you break down what uh, what we know? Yeah, so we learned um, after, uh, I think it was Tuesday, maybe, might have been Wednesday, Senate District 2, currently held by uh, Art Robinson, who's a Republican, but he's caucusing independently of the Republican caucus. He uh, has been, uh, well, he, he wouldn't be allowed on to file by the Secretary of State based on a rule um, that they're abasing on Measure 113, um, which is currently being litigated in the courts or expecting to um uh, oral arguments in December and then a decision from the Supreme Court sometime after that. Uh, but anyway, Robinson intends to Art Robinson intends to run if he's allowed to. Uh, if the vic, if the lawsuit overturns Measure One Thirteen, Noah Robinson, his son, one of his sons, has filed in the event that Art is not allowed on the ballot. And Representative Christine Goodwin uh, from the one half of that seat in the House has filed to run for Senate, leaving her House District 4 vacant, which Alex Garlados filed for, we already talked about. That's um to for an incumbent senator to potentially receive a challenge from a sitting state representative is unique. It doesn't happen very often. And so um, I think Measure 113 obviously creating a little bit of um, potentially some angst on the Republican side. And so Goodwin um filing to um take advantage of that and also she has she has been a republican caucus member of the house side and so the expectation is she'd probably be uh rejoin the republican caucus on the uh senate side the other district senate district 12 kind of uh em hill um and some polk county i think and probably pieces of others um the current in is incumbent brian boquist who was an independent Although I believe he's re-registered as Republican because when he filed for office again, uh, or uh, when he tried to file anyway, his filing showed up as a Republican. He's also um, barred from running under Measure 113 as it's currently being interpreted by the Secretary of State. So uh, Bruce Starr, who's a former uh, Republican senator previously from Hillsborough area, he is running, uh, he now lives in, uh, I believe, Newburgh, and he okay. is running... Uh, Dundee, I'm sorry, yes. And he's I think he's on the Dundee City Council, actually, now that I think about it. And Bruce uh, Bruce Starr is running in that seat should Brian Boquist um, not be able to 
make a run. And so those are two, um, I would say, incredibly solid candidates for um, Republicans in the Senate uh, in the event things develop as we think they may with with Measure 113. The interesting so the, thing... Think... Oh, go ahead, Ray. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Didn't mean to cut you off. No, and I think that just if you're adding, you're taking two members who have been independent caucusing but aligned with the Republicans and potentially replacing them with two people who would actually caucus for the Republicans um, and also technically flipping one seat back from I to R, even though everyone knows Boquist has been a Republican and voted um, as Republicans on all of on all the national sites. Everyone's going to write Republicans flipped a seat because it went from independent to R because their data sets are just That's based like, on. Isn't that I, funny, Ben? Th there is some reporting that says that I flipped House District 25 because it was previously held by Bill Post. So <laughs> I do take I do take credit. Redistricting for that. <laughs> years are very challenging because R has picked up like four seats in the Senate. But because of the way things shifted, we only picked up one. It's weird. <laughs> Uh, the only thing I was going to add on that is um, what I'm interested to watch. The timing of the Supreme Court decision will be very interesting because depending on how they rule, um, I think there are some candidates who are filing or who will file who, even if the in incumbent Republicans get to run again, they will still have a primary challenger. Yeah. Um, and I think there's others who like, I think, I don't think Bruce Starr said it explicitly in his press release, but he said something along the lines of, I will be, or he's waiting, to, depending on what happens to Senator Boquist or something like that. Mm -hmm. So there's some people who are pretty, being pretty open about, you know, whether the incumbent runs again is what will determine whether I run. And I think there are other folks who are not saying that in their press release and may end up running anyway, although who knows? Uh, lots I think one way to look at that, and I don't, I don't know if this is how they're looking at this, this is just literally popped in my head, Ben, Star and Boquist served together before when mm -hmm. Star was in the House. Senator Boquist was still in that Senate seat and Star was in the other Senate seat. And so they've served together. So that might be the reason there's a little bit more deference there because they've been colleagues before, whereas some of these others have not served together closely. Mm -hmm. They might have served at the same time, but in different chambers. And so you don't always develop a strong relationship um, across the aisle. For instance, Ben hasn't really made an effort to uh, talk to me on the Senate side. I'm just a lonely staffer there. He's a freshman member of the House taking all these meetings. Right. Um, so you see how it's, it's challenging for our relationship. I would be happy to try to pencil you in in 2026 or so if uh, if you're still interested. OK, sounds good. I'll, I'll put it on my calendar morning or afternoon. <laughs> I'm actually busy there, that day. So let's uh, there's maybe... there's a great Ronald Reagan joke, Ben, where um, this guy in communist Russia, he goes to buy a car and there's a 10 year waiting period because they don't produce very many cars because they're a communist country. They're not a capitalist country. And um, he goes to sign all the paperwork and puts his down payment. And uh, they say, uh, OK, w would you like it delivered 10 years from today in the morning or the afternoon? Uh, and. Uh, oh, no. Oh, no, no, no. He asks. He asks, can he be delivered in the morning or afternoon if he has a choice? And they said, well, 10 years from now, we're delivering a car. What difference did it make? And he says, well, the plumber is coming in the morning. <laughs> Just a little uh, good Ronald Reagan uh, jab at, uh, at the communists. Simpler times. Uh, all right, Reagan. Do you have any closing thoughts for this esteemed episode of the Oregon Bridge podcast? Uh, ben, election year is a horrible year, except that it's a great <laughs> year, except that it's horrible. Um, so I'm really excited for elections and I'm dreading them. And I think that most um, Americans share that feeling. I think uh, that's right. The Republican primary for president is getting a little ugly and we'll probably still get uglier as we go through it. Uh, Democrats, I, I just so I sent this to you, Ben. But um, uh, Biden advisors fighting with Obama advisors uh, uh, publicly on Twitter about if Biden should be a candidate in 2024 is not something I would have expected uh, to see. So really, it's just crazy everywhere, Ben. And I would encourage um, our viewers to, of course, stay civically involved and then shut their computers off and, and go be people also, because it's still a long, long time into the elections. That's right. That's right. Uh, well, my dog has broken into the uh, podcast studio here. So with that, I think it's time for us to leave. Uh, thank you, everyone, for listening to the podcast. Please subscribe on YouTube. And uh, we will see you back here next week.